think I'm in focus. All right, mate. We're back. Okay. What's going on? So in our first Enigma video, we left you on a bit of a cliffhanger. I was just about to show you the floor in the Enigma machine. Now, we only intended that to be a short video, but when we saw the reaction to our first Enigma video, we decided to come in to film again and to give you an even more detailed look of the floor of the Enigma machine and how they broke the code. So that's, that's all right for you because we're doing this in Cambridge. I had to drive. <laughs> I had to drive. I had to drive for three hours <laughs> to come and do this. That's how much we care about number five viewers. So do you want me to carry on? Go on. So. Uh, no, you have them, you have now. So it's like try a few different ones, so it's like, hmm, that one didn't work. And like just change all the different rows at different times. Yeah. So there were, there were 10,000 people by the end of the war working at Bletchley Park. It was a huge operation. So they weren't all code breakers. A lot of them would be, you know, secretaries and staff. Some of them would be translators, because you would have to translate these messages from German to English. Some of them would be mathematicians who would be working on the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, a lot of these girls were uh, from the, the Navy and they would be operating these bomb machines. They had a dozen of these bomb machines. In the middle, in the middle. So G yeah, is connected to T. Oh, hang on. Oh, no. So it was really important for the Germans not to realize that we had broken their code. Now, this is a very serious point because winning the battle is not as important as protecting the source of the information that we had broken this code. And some people had to be sacrificed, and it's awful. Uh, we knew that they were going to be attacked, and we couldn't get them out because it would have been too obvious that we had broken the Enigma code. Uh, we had to be very careful how we use that information so that we don't give away that we had broken that Enigma code. There are some amazing stories of how they used this knowledge. Uh, so, uh, D-Day, okay, so D-Day 1944, uh, we had set up uh, some false information. We said we were going to land in another place further up the, the French coast. And by breaking the Enigma messages, we were able to know for sure that the Germans had completely fallen for all this fake information that we were sending out. So we could confidently invade the Normandy beaches as we did in the end. That's things like that, amazing. Uh, there was a Japanese ambassador who sent a message, I think it was with the Enigma machine, he sent uh, messages back home to Japan about the uh, battlements at Normandy. Fantastic, we had this lovely list of all the battlements uh, at the Normandy beach. Very useful. That V there, hang on. Yeah, the V, yeah. that's V. And keep the hand your side, not my side. So the bomb machine was named in honour of a previous Polish code-breaking machine called Bomba. Uh, some say that Bomba was named after a type of ice cream. Some say it was named after the ticking noise it made. Uh, some say it was just as good a name as any. Uh, the Bomba machine was designed by a Polish code-breaker called Marian Rajewski. Now that used a, a flaw in the way that the Germans were using the Enigma machine and it could break Army and Air Force Enigma messages, but it couldn't break naval Enigma messages. So what Alan Turing had to do was find a way to break Army, Air Force and Navy Enigma messages and a way that was a bit more robust. So if the Germans decided to change their procedures, which was very likely that they could still break the Enigma code. So the first bomb machine was finished by March 1940. It was called Victory. Now, it was a very good thing that they managed to finish that machine because a couple of months later, in May 1940, the Germans changed their procedures, which means all the Polish methods stopped working. And from that point on, they, we were using the bomb machine to break the Enigma code. That's for the rest of the war. So the Polish did this first. They broke, they started breaking the code in 1932. So way before World War II, they knew that Germany was a threat. They had started trying to break Enigma code. Uh, traditionally, code breakers would be language specialists. So people who are good at languages, classics, people who studied Greek, that sort of thing. Uh, but this is a technological problem. Suddenly, they had this Enigma machine to break technological problem that needed a technological solution and they needed to get in mathematicians 
Uh, so they started, uh, a man called Marian Rajewski was one of the main people who was able to completely work out the Enigma wiring without seeing the machine. Uh, just using the codes and mathematical equations, he was able to work out the Enigma wiring. Now they've got the machine. Fantastic, amazing. And then they had to start working out those secret settings. That was harder. Then, well, let's see. I'll try and skip my story along. All right, then. Because I always thought it was the Brits who were the heroes. You've told me it was the Poles that did it. The Poles did it first. And five weeks before Poland was invaded, uh, there was a secret meeting in Kabaki Woods in Poland between the British code breakers and the Polish code breakers. And the Polish code breakers shared their secrets with the British. The British continued their work. Uh, we used the Polish ideas for about six months. Uh, the Polish ideas were great for breaking army codes and air force codes. Um, the Polish weren't able to break the naval codes, unfortunately. Uh, and we did use their ideas, like I said, for about six months until the Germans changed their procedures. They changed their procedures in such a way that suddenly all the Polish ideas stopped working completely. Useless, throw them out because they don't work anymore. And from that point on, we had to use our own methods, the British methods, for breaking the Enigma code, uh, which is due to Bletchley Park, which was this place full of very clever people. Uh, 10,000 people worked at Bletchley Park near the end of the war, which is a lot. But I should mention one person by name, which is Alan Turing. <laughs> so do you want to turn the turn the rotors a bit? It's pretty exciting it's stuff. It's fantastic. Oh, it's wonderful. And there is a reason why I, sh I want to show this off. Because this is such an inspiring story because it shows how mathematicians can save lives. And that's what they did. They weren't soldiers and they weren't fighting, but it was about using your brains to save people's lives. And this is a real job. Breaking codes is a real job today. You can do this today and you can save lives today. Some people watching this, James, probably don't know that a big part of your job is touring around mm. and showing people the Enigma machine. You tell this story all the time to so many people. You must be sick of it by now. I can't be, I can't be sick of it, no, never. No, because it's just wonderful. This is such a special piece of history. It's. I, not only that, but it's how clever the ideas underneath are. And I love telling the story because it does show how important mathematics can be. This is a fascinating, exotic, useful application of real maths.